John Elliot Gardner, there is no hyphen between the John and the Elliot. No. Why is this? Um, I come from Quaker stock on my mother's side, and they all had double barrel names, but they didn't bother to put the hyphen in, like the French, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Louis, but without the hyphen. I'm going to ask you to count us down, please. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Go. As well as being a conductor, you live and work on a farm. I do. If I was to say to you, I am going to take away either classical music or the countryside forever, which would you give up? Oh, you'd dismember me. I, I couldn't answer that. The two things are absolutely vital in my life, and they really do balance out because music occupies one's heart and one's brain and one's talent, such as it is, and farming uh, occupies a completely different function in my life. It's to do with um, creating food, finding, looking after animals, uh, looking after the countryside, and that's refreshment, but also a different set of challenges. You've got to have both. And the countryside has been in you and with you from the word go, hasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I grew up on a farm. Quite close to where you actually live now. Absolutely. Tell me, favourite piece of music ever? Bach's B minor mass. Why? It's got everything in it. It's a sort of omnium gatherum of, of music of different periods of his life. It's, it's the Catholic mass, but it's written by a Protestant composer. It's got drama. It's got incredible vitality. It's got euphoria. It's got sadness. It's got everything. A favourite composer ever? Oh, uh, Monteverdi. Not Bach? No. Why? Monteverdi's the man. He's the Shakespeare of music. He's the one who really encapsulates the, the, the human passions, the emotions, and channels them into music. It's so brilliant what he does. Nobody, nobody came, came near him in that way. Is it possible to be remotely objective about the greatest composer no, ever? No, it's an entirely subjective feeling. What's the best bit about being a conductor? I think it's the anticipation, it's the preparation that leads to that first, the frisson, the, the, the first contact you have with your musicians, and then building a sort of base of complicity with them, and then leading to performance, and performance then of course is, is a high and in its in own terms, because you've got an audience that potentially can either enhance that performance or, or break it. Is there a toughest bit of being a conductor? Oh, it depends. If, uh, if you're being a guest conductor, in other words, if you're just moving into a, a new orchestra, you never can, it's like a one night stand. It can be either euphoric and wonderful or it can be a total disaster. Um, it, it, there are very many different, difficult things about conducting, mastering the score, learning how to <coughs> communicate with musicians um, to bring out the best in them. There are many, many good, bad things and good things, actually. Do you lean more towards being an autocratic or a democratic conductor? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably more autocratic than democratic because <clears throat> democracy and music don't really go together, maybe in string quartets, maybe in small formations, but somebody, it's, it's a matter of finance and, and, and practicality. Somebody actually has to cut the mustard and make decisions. The trick about it is to try and make those decisions while actually giving the impression to the musicians that they're the ones who are doing it. That's quite hard to do. Do you think there will ever be another Beethoven? And by that, I don't mean someone who writes in the style, composes in the style of Beethoven, but someone who will come to be seen as great, as great as Beethoven. Unlikely, but let's hope. I mean, there, there's enough talent around. It's a question of will it break through in the way that Beethoven broke through? And, you know, Beethoven's all to do with his deafness, too. That's such a crucial part of it, because one has enormous admiration and sympathy for him that he managed to create these mind-blowing pieces, and he was deaf. Are you always trying to find something new in a piece of music when you conduct? Yes, or trying to discover really what the composer had in, in his ear and, and how he wanted it to sound in his inner ear, like Beethoven. Um, and then to try and replicate it as much as much as possible, but not out of a spirit of um, in a spirit of, of archaeology or you know some sort of spurious reverence, but because if that music is to speak to us today, it needs to be with the sharp sharpness and the edge of the previous composer. Why has working with period instruments been so important to you? You're a hip conductor, aren't you? And you can explain that <laughs> historically informed practice. Yeah, I'm hip um, because it dishes at one moment all the, the accretions and the guff that's um, 
surrounded music of a later period retrospectively. In other words, that if you want to do Bach, uh, up until about the 1950s, he was performed as though he was Brahms or, or, or Wagner. And now, with period instruments and with a, a more historical informed practice in your, in your inner ear, you can do something much more interesting. Quickly, outside music, outside farming, interests, passions. Oh, cricket, rugby, sex. <laughs> and that, John Elliott, God, is it. I'm going to cheat because I do just want to ask you this question, which we didn't have time for. Why is classical music not bigger than it is? Oh, it's because uh, people have this false um, idea that it's intimidating and that it's somehow remote from their lives and it's not it needn't be it's it's the fault of the practitioners we we musicians don't present it well enough and you absolutely love it i do absolutely live and breathe it absolutely very good to see you